All right. Well, they're getting set up. I'm going to do a little, uh, a little lightning talk sans screen. So we used to be a community of startups. Ten years ago, there, were there was no such company as Booking. Now, Booking donates regularly hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Pearl community so that we can do things like this, right? They're not the only one. Shutterstock. There used to be these other big companies like Amazon and eBay that were entirely Pearl, and now they've either left Pearl entirely or they only use Pearl as part of it. We used to be a community of startups. These days, we don't see that many startups, and I wish we would see more. I am one of the few that I know of, at least, that do, does a lot of Pearl startups, and I would love to see more people doing this. I would love to see more people succeed in it. I tend to do about one, a new, one new startup a year. I'm not saying everybody should do that. It's crazy. Don't do it. But what you should do is just build something. The reason you should do this is it's going to help you, for one. If you do, if you do well, uh, you're going to make money. If you do poorly, you're going to learn something. Okay? But beyond that, you're going to help Pearl. You help Pearl in two ways when you do a startup. One, you bring awareness to Pearl. You bring awareness to the fact that Pearl is an important, relevant language that startups build on top of. Okay? It'll bring more people to Pearl. And you're bringing more money to Pearl, which brings more jobs to Pearl, which automatically brings more people to Pearl. If there are jobs, people will come find those jobs, right? So do a startup. Build something. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be something simple like a blog. It could be something uh, complex like a video game. It really doesn't matter what the startup is. Just build something. And if you need help building something, if you need help getting started, I'm willing to help you. I, ha I have a, a vast experience of doing this. I've started 14 businesses in the last 10 years. So I'm willing to help you. <laughs> JT at plainblack.com or just come see me in the hallway. I will get you started, okay? Just build something. Hello, everybody. I am Nick Perez, uh, Booking.com. Uh, we're having a meet and drink uh, on Wednesday, tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock at Fido's Irish uh, Pub. Uh, there's details. Uh, you can come find me, and I can give you the details where it is. It's on 4th Street, I think, something like that. Uh, everyone is welcome, uh, especially if you're looking for uh, potentially a, a, an expat experience and to come uh, work with us in beautiful Amsterdam. Uh, uh, also, uh, I'm holding a uh, symposium talk tomorrow, 1.30, in this symposium room to uh, talk about my experiences as uh, an American expat in Amsterdam. So if you have any questions about uh, what, it, what it's like, uh, the problems that I had, uh, I'll just be generally talking about my experience and I'll be answering any questions. Thank you. Hi. I've got a small announcement about the wooden nickels, the tuits that everybody is collecting by now, I hope. Um, I got it done that on Thursday we are welcome at the wooden nickel factory to have a tour. Uh, Thursday, uh, late afternoon, we're going to see how wooden nickels are, are made. Trees come in, the nickels come out. Join me. Hi, everyone. Someone gave me a microphone. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, in honor of the fact that we're in Texas, everyone, let's do a yeehaw. Combined together with kind of the arm. We're, okay, one, two, three. Yeehaw! And then the way. Come on! Ha, ha, ha. 
And, and I think it's about the time to start the main event. One other thing, Duke, I haven't seen you yet. If you don't come up front soon, I'm giving your spot away. And I'm giving it back to the person who I bumped to tomorrow in the first place. My name is Henry Van Stein. This is my first Yapsi. It's really been awesome. <laughs> so this is a, a really impromptu presentation. I, um, I'm going to tell you about um, uh, this application framework that um, we've been developing for the last few years called Rapid App. It's based on um, Perl, Catalyst, XJS. Um, basically what it does is it provides um, a way to generate interfaces for DBIC schemas very quickly. Um, and it, it basically ties, um, ties the uh, DBIC schema all the way through to the front end to the XJS um, data store, which provides full um, CRUD and um, interactive capabilities um, on top of that. So I think the best way to, to demonstrate that is with some live demos, which is what I have here. Um, and this is a live site, and you can, I'll give you the login, and you can actually log in and play with this if you're interested. But Hope, hopefully that won't crash the server if too many people are interested, but we'll see. That'll be interesting. Um, so I wanted to, um, to, to do a demo. I um, wanted to find some sample data um, to pull in. So what this application is here, this MIMECAST, this is a, a, a quick data model that I put together to represent uh, email messages. And so what I did is I just um, hacked this model together, and then I uh, loaded it with data from some common Perl mailing lists so that we can look at some real data and, and play with it. So um, here's a, the, the sort of the standard view um, is the grid view, which you know is uh, sortable. Um, you know you can move these things around, uh, adjust the order of things. Um, you, you know, double click to view items, um, and then also apply um, you know miscellaneous kinds of, of filters. So we can build um, we can build queries. Um, we have a query editor, so I can say, um, add a condition, say that um, date um, is after, and it understands the data model. I didn't have to tell it that this interface should be a date selector. It knows because it knows the data model and automatically provides appropriate interfaces. So I can select, you know, a time frame, apply that, and, you know, boom, it'll do that. And there's also other bells and whistles. Um, I can actually just type in, I can say minus one month, for instance, and it'll be minus one month. And there's other, um, um, you know, we can add, you know, you know, and this is a, you know, you can build this out to a whole query, you know, whole query structure of, you know, whatever you can think of. Um, but uh, also, so there's other um, other capabilities. Again, it understands the um, it understands the data model. So it understands things like uh, like this is a size column. This is an integer field. So we have uh, summary functions, and so it'll provide summary functions that oops, that make sense to that. So I can like do a total, and now boom, it's going to total up that column 34k. I can for other other things like um, like from which this is just going to be a, you know, a varchar in the back end. Summary function could be, you know, um, count unique. So there you go, there's four unique from addresses in that time range that we saw there. Um, and so then once you've built up one of these nice views that has all sorts of rules, and then of course you can, you know, you can do searches. We can just type in, you know, search terms. There's something that's probably gonna have entries. And anyway, so once you've, once you've built up this view, you can go ahead and save it, um, you know, as whatever. And now this view has been saved, and um, here it is now in this navigation tree, and I can organize the nav tree. And, you know, let's say I want to make this public here. Here's my new one that I just created. I can just drag this stuff around. I can, um, you know, make a new folder. And I can drag stuff into it, you know, and then that just persists immediately, and boom, it saves it, and now that's there. So what's really cool, our client that uses this, is they're able to build and author their own views um, just out of the box. So this one is a, this is a, a read-only, this is a read-only interface. Um, really quick, I'll show you, um, 
I'll show you one that is writable. And this is another demo, and this is, I'll leave this up. We can, I probably don't have enough time to show anything. But, so we can, so here's something that's editable. I'll edit it from the grid. I can, you know, here's a category. This is actually a relationship. So I'm editing the relationship. It's automatically giving me a dropdown. I can, this editor interface is actually opens another grid. So I can actually then search in the grid, select an item. These are relationship columns. Anyway, I'm probably about to get buzzed out. So let me leave with, if you want to play with this, here are the two sites that I've just looked at here. Username and password. And you can, it's all test data, so you can go crazy and trash it and do whatever. And if you're interested in helping me on this project, contact info here is below. Thank you very much. I took the microphone from somebody. Hey. Uh, so tonight, uh, we are close to the, um, to the bridge. What is it? Congress Street Bridge, where there are about a million bats coming out around sunset, around 8.31 PM, give or take. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, walking from our dinner down there uh, to try and watch these bats. So if anybody wants to come around, uh, we're going to take a quick walk. It's only a few blocks away. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mike Greb. I work at Linode. Uh, this is monitoring fire and EMS dispatch with Pearl. When I look out my window, I see the ambulances pulling out of the driveway and hear them. And uh, since I'm nosy, I want to know where they're going. And you hear some great stuff. Um, two weeks ago, EMS got dispatched to pick up a patient at a uh, old folks home and they said I'm sorry we're not sure of the location within the facility they're still chasing the patient around <laughs> we'll get that to you I like to think of a 90 year old naked person running around <laughs> yelling uh, all the stuff all my stuff is in uh, Galloway Township and that's where it is so basic, basic theory, your walkie-talkies you had when you were eight, simplex operation, they listen and transmit on the same frequency. With a repeater, you listen and transmit on a different frequency. When you press the talk button, your radio automatically switches to the transmit frequency. Some repeater with a giant antenna up on a pole, listens and rebroadcasts that out on the listen frequency so everybody in the area can hear you. You can take that a step further with a digital trunking system and to explain it in this amount of time, we'll just look at the Atlantic County system which has seven distinct sites, 14 municipalities use it, 50 agencies. They have 181 talk groups which Think of that as like an IRC channel or uh, on an old simplex radio, that would be a frequency. So if you were going to do basic repeating for that many talk groups, you need 362 frequencies and that doesn't scale. So here's an example of what some of those talk groups look like. This is the actual Galloway Township talk groups. Of note, police one there has a D that's digital, and that makes me sad because I can't listen to it without spending another thousand bucks. So this is my setup at home. I have a Uniden HP1, which is about 500 bucks, much to my wife's dismay. It connects to a netbook, which then streams it out to my Linode, including metadata for what frequency and person is transmitting. From there, it's a published IceCast stream and I have lots of little Perl utilities that listen to that stream and do cool stuff. This FIC slash FPLS is awesome. It's a C app that will listen to an IceCast stream. It can pipe the audio to standard out so that you can pipe it on into something else. 
I use it to generate hourly MP3s with all of the silence removed. So a typical hour long MP3 becomes anywhere from zero seconds to three or four minutes. Really active ones are maybe 10, 12 minutes. I actually call that previous command from a Perl script that kicks it off once an hour. So we have individual MP3s, one per hour. It also reads the metadata stream. And you see down there at the bottom, it looks up like the user ID. I have a text table that translates user IDs to human readable things like dispatch and medic2. It also color codes on standard out. <laughs> uh, I also recently wrote a script, Perl script, that analyzes the dispatch tones, which sound like this. They're, they're very quiet. You have to really listen. No. Uh, so it's just a couple tones. And if you did a manual FFT, you'd see this. But somebody made a really awesome module called Audio Analyzer. And with that much code, you can perform an FFT on a chunk of audio. I do it in real time. I detect the dispatch tones. Again, I have a lookup table. A lot of municipalities are weird and think that this is a security risk for the public to know this, so they won't just tell you. You have to brute force it. <laughs> yes, that means I set fires at prescribed locations. <laughs> to get the station I'm interested in dispatched. <laughs> I also monitor and send F SMSs to me to tell me that shit might be real. <laughs> and the 10 second live demo, never mind. <laughs> Go to GallowayNow.com if you want to see it. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, there was a, a, a message, uh, an, an advertisement earlier about going to visit the wood nickel factory in San Antonio. Um, I'm at Loose Ends on Thursday, and I really want to go down to Lockhart and um, visit all four barbecue restaurants down there. Um, I know it's a cliche, like a fat guy that wants to go to a barbecue restaurant, but um, I'm a cliche. So anyway, uh, I have a car, and um, I have seating for two more people. Um, so if you're interested in going to Lockhart and then down to San Antonio, uh, come and find me. Thanks. Hi, my name is Andrew Doherty. Um, I'm interested in artificial intelligence and uh, improving Pearl's competitivity in that area. Um, so I just, I believe this, that is, um, oops, I don't believe that. Oh, is it still down? Oops. I thought it was uh, one second. So anyway, um, just in case I spend all the time debugging this, uh, I just wanted to say that I have a display outside, and uh, I need help making uh, releasing the packages for CPAN. I have about uh, 2,000 of them that do various AI things. Um, OK, I, I can leave, or I can. Uh, go for it. Okay, so it's just uh, it's good to help people with tools that solve problems, as you all know. Um, so 14 years I've been working on it, 2,000 modules. Um, I have APIs to wrap most open source AI applications. And I also have software. I'm making uh, a comprehensive ontology of all the Floss software out there. Well, using Floss will, uh, to bootstrap it, but with natural language processing. Um,
<laughs> um, some AI capabilities uh, does practical reasoning, general game playing, natural language processing, text mining, inference, and semantic web. Um, some uh, general purpose capabilities because it's a social software. The purpose is to help people uh, provide a social safety net, free life planning, uh, temporal planning and execution, personal finance, meal planning, document management, job search system, and distributed team-based problem solving. And uh, and um, so my goal is to get one module on CPAN. I'd really appreciate anyone I'm willing to pay um, to get the process started. Uh, see my panel display, and also if anyone wants to review my code and vouch for my grant application to the Pearl Foundation. Thanks. How do I turn this on? Is it on? Yes. Awesome. All right. Uh, hi there. My name is Dave Rolski, and apparently uh, I just volunteered to join the Pearl Foundation Fundraising Committee earlier today. <laughs> and committee member, I'm going to do a little pitch for you. So the Pearl Foundation exists to support the Pearl community, and it does that in various ways. So one of the ways is it helps conference organizers put on events like YAPSI, for example, and the various Pearl workshops around the world. TBF also provides grants to support work on Pearl projects. Uh, they've given over $150,000 in grants on, for Pearl 5 core maintenance work, for example. And there's also a new outreach program for women in open source. Working with the GNOME Foundation, we have somebody who's contributing to Moose through that, and she's getting paid to work on that, which is fantastic. And there's also a lot of behind the scenes work. Don't ding me. Uh, like legal issues, dealing with trademarks, stuff like that. Now, you might think that the Pearl Foundation gets funded just through corporate donations, but we also need the support of communi community members like yourself. If you make a living from Pearl, <laughs> keeping, keeping Pearl healthy is in your best interest. I'm not done yet. Give me 15 seconds. You get <laughs> You can, you can take a minute. You can take a minute. It's okay. That's on. Cool. So uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about uh, one of the options that you have that Matt Trout actually talked about. Um, some continuous integration tools are basically a tool to help you push things out to your environment and hopefully maintain some stuff. So. So I'm Adam. Uh, I go by Stylus Eater on uh, IRC. And first off, actually, I wanted to echo a statement that was made earlier. Uh, this is my first Yapsi. It's really freaking awesome. And I love you guys. <laughs> but I especially love Matt Trout. I mean. <laughs> so Jenkins, uh, like I said, is a, they call it, I guess, continuous integration server. Uh, it's written in Java. And the way I run it is I put it on top of Tomcat and then put Apache in front of it. So. The reason why we use it at my work is that, so I started and we have a couple hundred servers. We have a bunch of Perl scripts that do monitoring. So my work, I work at a bank. Uh, unfortunately, I take care of really buggy middleware systems and really crappy code that runs on top of those, so it's even worse. But we use it to do a whole slew of things. Uh, <laughs> one popular script, of course, is an out of memory monitor script uh, that runs across the entire environment. But since you have hundreds of servers, how do you, make sure that the proper script is pushed out to that many servers on top of three different environments. And oh, by the way, there's also this one environment in AIX. There's another one in Solaris. Uh, it's just all kind of spread out nastiness, basically. So I came in, and one thing we started doing, which was really dumb, but we have to because of security concerns, is actually building kind of our own CPAN uh, and actually reinventing a lot of modules that are out there already. So how do you keep this stuff consistent? Well, you can use rsync, and actually this is kind of a wrapper around rsync in some ways. But what we do is we have git set up, and we have uh, a post receive, uh, post commit hook that then calls Jenkins, and then that workflow basically then 
checks out the code and actually does the push model, not the pull model, sorry, Matt, uh, and make sure that all the scripts are consistent across the environment. So once someone commits code to Git, it just triggers automatically and boom, all the systems are up to date. It's really nice. And unless, of course, they're offline or networks down or something like that. And then typically we have other issues. So typical idea is that you want to migrate stuff from, say, dev to prod or and then monkey patch prod because you didn't do it properly uh, <laughs> in the first time around. And then uh, essentially you can use this tool, which I'll do a uh, quick just tell you what it looks like. You can use this tool then to uh, make sure that, oh, not fail. Wow, awesome fail. Let's try it again. Do we have a winner? And we do. Yay! So basically, uh, you have this section in the upper left. You can create new jobs. And new jobs, it's really just an ad hoc approach to jobs. So many different plugins exist that it's kind of crazy in terms of what's available. You can go out here and it'll tell you if plugins are out of date, blah, blah, blah. Um, oop, wrong button. So all of these plugins are available and it just goes on and on and on and on. Plugins that tie into Maven, plugins that tie into AMP, plugins that tie into Git, plugins that tie into PVCS, really awful versioning control system, and just about anything out there really. And what you do is you create a workflow and you plug these pieces in and they give you different functionality. So say you want to uh, have this crazy ant build script that does all this stuff and then you want to slap in a different version control system or you want to mix in maybe starting up a, a, a VM with Vagrant or something like that or, or spin up something else, you can kind of just create all these ad hoc workflows to do a lot for you. So what I use it for actually is out here, I'm reviving the Cleveland Perl mongers um, and I just have a job out here that whenever I push code, it runs, it stops Hypnotoad, it starts Hypnotoad uh, after copying everything out. Um, I know you don't necessarily need to do that, but just making sure it does that. And then I also make sure that I do um, a said substitution on a variable so there's a timestamp associated when it, with when that change went out there. So. It's a pretty cool tool to use. Uh, we've used it also in addition to keeping things synchronized to actually do installations because Jenkins allows you to actually create parameters and really strict use of parameters to make sure that they're integer or string or whatever option. And we actually do installation of Apache and installation of our middleware systems with it. So. Anyone here have a Fitbit? Is anyone in the Fit the Perlmonger's Fitbit group? Like two or three of us. Anyone wants to join? It's very simple. Search for Perlmonger's in the Fitbit community, and you can join our group. That's it. So any of you want Perl on Android? I mean, you have an Android phone or something like that? Because uh, pretty recently, the Perl Foundation started a grant to get Perl working on Android. And it's there. So it's just need all of you to come by and test it. So if you want Perl on Android, come nag me. I'm the guy with the Yapsi t-shirt. There's only 200 of us. <laughs> um, and I'll try to help you install it and, or compile it, and, or we'll see. So thank you all. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, parallel recursion for web services. This is kind of a nice segue off of uh, MST's previous comments about just keeping things simple when you're doing complicated things, and I can't emphasize that enough. So this, these are lessons I learned from um, Elsa. I talked at last year's Yapsi in Madison about uh, Elsa. It's a it's a kind of a and I, I don't like to use the word big data anymore because it's so overused, but do, you know, data warehousing, giant amount of logs. Uh, in one of the previous talks, I mentioned that as uh, something you can use either with or as an alter alternative to Logstash. And uh, it's all written in Perl. And uh, I, before I go any further, I want to thank everyone here who's contributed many of the hundreds of modules that's made that possible. 
uh, I hope that it's been a good application for those modules, but uh, to Moose and Plaque and, and everybody out there, for, thank you so much for, for what you've done. And uh, this is all GPL, so if, if you're interested in helping, uh, please do uh, on the Google Code site there. So the, the major problem is scaling beyond uh, simple load balancing. So th that's where if, if you're saying, I've got a, a database and I need to fit a lot of data in it, uh, how, how many of you set up MySQL cluster? Has anybody done that? I tried to do that in 2003. I got it successfully working and it was not fun. Uh, it's much better now, I'm sure, but uh, the, the, the overall idea really taught me an important lesson. <laughs> I might be wrong about that. Uh, and it goes, goes to say with uh, Oracle, or even uh, I use MongoDB a fair amount, and it's the same there. Uh, my, uh, my philosophy that I want to at least uh, present for your consideration, won't work in all situations, is that sometimes it's better to take the data source and keep it close to the data and then put your uh, services API on top of that. So that, that's, it doesn't work in every situation, but if it does, I highly recommend doing that and doing the aggregation in the application layer because then you have these perfect little cookie cutters everywhere and you don't have to deal with things like master-slave replication, all that kind of stuff. If you can, at least at the, uh, the database layer, then you get to do it in your code where you get to do the debugging, where you get to control what goes where. And if, if you get nothing else out of this talk, I, that's what I really want to impress upon you. Now, and also the big problem is IO workload. And this would be true of any, th any kind of high read write uh, situation. So it doesn't matter whether it's event data or not. Anytime you've got a lot of data coming in and you need to distribute that load, I think this is a good model. So the, the big problem is if any one part of that breaks, are you gonna be able to figure that out at 3 a.m. At, at night? And I, the, the system that I'm, I use in Elsa and that I, I encourage others to use, I think helps with that. So one of the first things I did with uh, basic scalability was just to parallelize everything. That's the, the, the Hadoop style where you just say, well, I'll throw a thousand pizza boxes at it and it'll all be great. And when I run something, I'll run it on all of them at the same time. And that's nice uh, until you have more than one data center or until you have natting between data centers. And then suddenly things get to be a little bit weird. And you also have some uh, limitations as far as the number of nodes. So what I implemented was uh, what, what I call parallel recursion. And if anybody knows the actual proper computer science term for this, let me know after the talk or humiliate me by yelling it now. But um, this, is, this is best I could come up with for, the, for what I was trying to do with it. And the key here is that on the diagram where you have these uh, children, those can be in, in different data centers. And nobody, the, the search head here doesn't have to have any idea that anything two levels below it exists and the, the mid-level guys don't have any idea that the search head exists. So the config never refers to any of them. So there's no IP addresses to go looking through the code like MST was talking about to see what's broken because they were never configured in the first place. Everything is either a web server or a web client. So each node has its uh, immediate peers and you can see that uh, because it's a tree you're gonna get log end performance. And the key here is that at every level, it's 100% Rust and JSON. That's the only protocol. So if you're setting up firewalls for the box, you need you know, 80 and 443 and port 20, uh, 22, and that's it. You might need to admin the box, but there's no database handles, none of that. All that stays on each box, and that makes things so much easier. So there, there's removes so many uh, points of failure when you're trying to figure out what goes where in an enterprise. And uh, here's the, just a little bit of code to kind of get the idea. So you can see there's an any event HTTP request in there. Uh, but the basic idea is that if you are, the, if you are 127001, then you're gonna run the local query. Otherwise, you're gonna recurse and send that to everybody you know and just kind of rebroadcast a query that comes in. And when the results come back, you aggregate those. So you're not aggregating results for 1,000 nodes. You're only aggregating the results for the nodes directly below you. So it scales. That's it. I wasn't finished, Jeff, geez. So what I wanted to say is all of you can support the Pearl Foundation individually. If you go to pearlfoundation.org and click on the donate button, I'd encourage you to sign up for a recurring donation. If everybody who came to the conference signed up for 20 bucks a month, it would be about 100,000 a year. And think of what sort of things that could fund, like more Pearl 5 core maintenance, new Pearl VMs like Steven was talking about, and all sorts of great stuff. So please donate, thank you.
Howdy. I'm into games, and I wanted to talk about a fallacy that I see programmers who are also into games fall into again and again, and which I quite suspect also affects anyone with a programmatic mindset who is passionate about a thing and loves to represent it in code, which is not in itself a bad thing. So this is a screenshot of the first complicated Perl-based project that I wrote under my own power. It is a uh, adaptation with a curses UI for a obscure board game designed by Andy Looney called Martian Chess, which my uh, thank yeah go uh, go Andy, which um, the office that I worked in uh, circa 2000 liked to play a lot. Uh, as you can see, I had some fun with it. Uh, it uh, used a raw talent interface. It had a chat window. It had a cursor-based uh, piece pickup. It was uh, a lot of fun. I said, oh, I really enjoyed this. I want to do this a lot more. So far, so good. So my next obvious target was a game design that I was playing around with myself uh, for a game called Currents. This is a archival photograph of it in play. Um, so OK, I started working on this. And immediately, I said, well, wait a minute. This game has a board. Well, Martian Chess also had a board. It would be really inefficient for me to, to, to just to reprogram that. I mean, clearly, I need to take a step back and make some sort of game board library. But hang on. Not all game boards are square, right? They, they're not all chess-based looking. So I think I need to take a step back. and I need to abstract this a little bit and maybe make a sort of more general uh, game class. Um, now, it's true that both of these games have four players, but that's not true for all games. Um, and maybe not all players, may, maybe they don't take turns. I mean, plenty of games are, are turnless, right? Or maybe you, you play in teams. Now, I've got to think about this some more. Um, so about six years passed, and eventually we came to this. <laughs> So I had a startup uh, called Volity, and uh, this was the front page of the website, and we had a Java client you could download, and uh, there were all these uh, games, uh, some of which were licensed from other companies, some were developed in-house. Uh, we had a dev blog, and we had an RSS feed on the dev blog because we were so interesting, and, and we were sure that people didn't want to miss a single thing we had to say, and we had wrote our own forum system, and very, very few people showed up to play these games. And uh, and the startup went away, and we were also kind of like, what what did we do wrong? Oh, that was interesting. Um, so a little bit of time passed. I started playing around with more uh, online multiplayer games. I started getting into console gaming. I'm like, oh well, uh, playing Xbox Live is fun, but you meet a lot of horrible people online. There ought to be there ought to be some way, like maybe I can I can put a Pearl project together. This is all done in Pearl, by the way. It's 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 a topic. Um, maybe I, I could I could throw a project together that would uh, allow you to like uh, you know meet. Uh, people online and so I know we'll make a giant website and we'll have a dead blog and the RSS feed and then uh, and uh, if you go to any of these websites right now uh, this is what you see you see a fill-in page that says sorry these aren't here anymore uh, this is written in catalyst by the way topic <laughs> Uh, there, there's a box you can put your email address in. I'm pretty sure that that's going somewhere, but I've been so depressed by this whole thing I haven't actually looked at it. <laughs> what? Where did I go wrong here? Um, so in both of these cases, what happened was there was a thing I wanted to make, and then I ended up saying, wait, I want to make this for the entire world. What I was actually doing was my target was me, and then I forgot that, and then my target was an entire cornfield of straw men who are a crap user base. The straw men will not come out of the cornfield and use your software. <laughs> so it turns out I can be taught. Uh, my project in 2010, I really like uh, old school interactive fiction games. I said, oh, I want to make one of these myself. Years ago, I would have said, I know, I'll write my own Perl backend with my own text parser because that can't be too hard. And I'll write a JavaScript front end that'll let me do my own uh, special effects. No, what I did was I picked up a language called Inform, which is great and lets you publish to the web out of the box. I wrote a game called The Warbler's Nest, which uh, I actually shipped. It is now being foisted upon uh, undergraduate students in digital humanities classes across the United States. They hate it. They send me hate mail, and I think that's awesome because I wrote it for me. <laughs> uh, 
But it was good enough that other, pe the other people are, pl are doing it anyway. And it exists, and that is awesome. Uh, later on, I got obsessed with uh, RAW 13. I wanted to bring it to modern social networks. I crapped out this Catalyst application. I wrote my own CSS in two weekends, you can tell. Uh, and here's people using it on Twitter. Uh, there's someone talking about the Transformers cartoon. That's uh, someone talking about Doctor Who, I guess. That's me and a friend talking about the Sean Carruth film, Mustroom Color, which is very good. And it's all in uh, RAW 13. And that's called Spoilerific, if you want to look at it in your own time. In conclusion, please do write the programs that drive you. Follow your passion. Just do not forget who you're writing it for. Thank you. Hi, if you have your phone on, please put it on vibrate. Uh, after lightning talks are over, uh, we're going to go uh, out of the auditorium. There will be some brown staff shirts which will guide you up the inner stairs and we will have buses that will take you directly over to the stage on 6th Street uh, where game night and the dinner banquet will begin. All right, today I'm going to be talking about XML and Perl. Uh, it's about Mojo DOM, a mo module. Mojo Licious and Mojo DOM. Uh, Mojo DOM is a module available on the CPAN. It's just part of Mojo Licious. And the tagline of Mojo Licious is web development can be fun again. There's a website. Um, we can use the module to traverse a DOM document object model tree. So that's HTML, X, HTML, XML, whatever. And I heard about it from a blog post by Joel Berger. Shout out to him. Uh, and it's a good candidate for interacting with an XML driven API. <laughs> uh, in my case, I used it for my first CPAN module web service, MRF, which is related to healthcare. I'm going to show you two examples. Uh, first one is just parsing XML, extracting values that are particular, node, particular nodes. And then um, the other example is modifying those certain values in place. So here's our first XML example, um, representing three music albums. We've got the CDs node. Uh, nested with CD artist title year. And I've got three albums here representing three decades, 70s, 80s, 90s. Here's the, the source code. to. We're going to parse through that XML and print out the three um, attributes, the artist title and year. Um, you can see inside of the for each loop that we're going to iterate through. Um, it's a Mojo collection object. And then we're, um, with the printf, I'm passing a list that um, using a CSS selector, title, artist, year, it's going to give us back uh, a list, and we're going to extract the text from each, and then we're going to report the size. So live demo. And I still have that mirror screens thing on. I should probably close that. OK. So uh, it works. Found CD, found CD, found CD. And there's three CDs total. OK. Um, second example. No, it's the same thing. OK. Um, this is a more complicated XML example. Uh, in this case, it's uh, software configuration. Um, the important lines here are the um, this idea of a, a channel in this piece of software, and then the channel has something called the destination. Um, so the, the channel is called foobar, and the destination it has two destinations, two bars, and two cucks. I don't know if I'm saying those metasyntactic variables correctly, but I don't know if anyone knows the right pronunciation. Um, what I want to do here is um, there's also these enabled nodes, which turns those destinations on or off in the software. Uh, they have a Boolean value, and I want to change it from true to false in my case. So here's the Perl to do that. <coughs> I'll dissect this one a little more. Um, we read in the XML file, make our DOM object again. Um, I've refactored the code into subroutines, so we're going to turn Cucks, the cucks one uh, off, and we're going to turn the other one, the boss off, and then we're going to turn back on, and then we're going to look at the, the difference between both in vimdiff um, and the code before I do the demo here. Um, we can extract it here and see if it's enabled, just looking at the enabled node, and to toggle it from on to off. Uh, we'll use the replace content method that Mojo DOM provides. Live demo. All right, so first we just read it in. Uh, Boz and they're both yes and yes. Uh, we turned the second one off. 
we turned both of them off. And we turned uh, the second one back on, but we left the first one off. We call vimdiff, and sure enough, that second one, boz, is went from true to false. The end. Hi, my name is Nick Milnick. I am from a company outside of Minneapolis called Digital River, specifically a small division called MyCommerce. We do e-commerce, small, medium businesses. We run on a Pearl Stack, Catalyst, DBIX Class, Moose, cool stuff, some cooler stuff coming. Still trying to figure out how to deal, or not deal, but really engage with the Pearl community, especially in terms of money. But we are looking for people soon, both full-time and contractors, both on-site and remote. Feel free to come find me, meet me. I'll buy you a beer and we can talk. But uh, thanks, everyone. Hey, hey. hey, hey. Actually, hey, hey means goodbye in Swedish. I learned it when Karl Masek was talking on the phone to his family for a long time and then said, hey, hey, and then put the phone down. <laughs> oh, OK, it means hello and goodbye. Well, hey, hey. Thank you, Carl. Um, who here has heard of the FizzBuzz algorithm? OK, quite a lot of you. Basically, all it is is something you might get on an interview question. It's print the numbers 1 through 100. But if the number is divisible by 3, print Fizz. Divisible by 5, print Buzz. And if it's divisible by both 3 and 5, print Fizz Buzz. And so here's a Perl one-liner that does Fizz Buzz. Yeah, OK. Pretty simple, right? OK, so let me show you Fizz Buzz in a different programming language. Now, <laughs> in the last 20 years, this is the coolest program I ever saw. And I saw it um, one day, but I didn't think much of it. Um, but let's see if this actually runs. So um, it's called SNUSP, S-N-U-S-P. And I'm going to run SNUSP on this example um, called fizzbuzz.snusp. And yes, it works. OK, so <clears throat> um, w what is SNUSP? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, a two-dimensional brain fuck. <clears throat> um, basically, you have a, a program pointer that moves around either um, east, west, north, or south. And it bounces. Only 10 of the characters in that file were actual code. Um, th these characters, it will bounce off a reflector, as you can see. Um, there's, there's those two. And then there's uh, some register shifters, increments and decrement. Um, for a register and then read and, and write. And then it has this little subroutine calling. This was actually called modular SNUSP. You can do all of them with, with just the first ones. And then there's bloated SNUSP that adds four more characters. Um, but that doesn't really tell you much about how the program works, does it? So um, let's actually watch the, the programming executing. You can actually has a debugger that comes with SNUSP. <laughs> OK, so the program starts at the dollar sign, or it starts in the, um, in the northwest corner. But this one has a dollar sign. So you can see right there below the cursor that there is a dollar sign. It started. Now, this cursor is traveling to the east. And, but now I'm going to single step through this. It's going to reflect off of this, go up. And it gets basically up to here, goes across all these no-op characters, this documentation. And then let's see what happens. Now, I can speed this up. And we can see that it's incrementing this register up in the upper corner, and it got to 66. That's, a, that's the character B. So later it knows it's going to need to print a B, so it's pre-calculating all these. Now we can speed this up quite a bit, get through the initialization phase. And now it's calculating 1 to see if, OK, so we got 1 down at the bottom. Everybody see that? There's 2. Now we expect fizz. Let's see if that works. Fizz. OK, great. And now we're in a little loop. I want to show you this loop. Um, so I'm going to single step through this loop. What is, see the, in the upper corner, there's a register right here that has the square brackets around it. And it's, every time it hits that minus, that register goes down to 1. So let's, let's let it go for a little bit. OK, got it. Um, well, shoot. All right, so got to get into that loop again. Where am I at? 42. 
Okay, and then I go, uh, now the question mark, when it gets down to zero, is going to skip over the next character, and it, it'll keep running. Um, that's all I want to show you on that, and it actually takes 150,000 steps to uh, execute that fizz buzz. <laughs> now, what is this program written in, and what was that interpreter? Well, of course it's written in Perl, and the actual code that existed only existed on this Ward Cunningham wiki from 2004. There's the code for it right there, and here's the debugger. I took those two things and put them together and made um, a fizzbuzz on CPAN called Language Fizzbuzz. You can check that out. But where did I originally found this? I found this on a site called Rosetta Code. Who's heard of Rosetta Code? Okay, Rosetta Code matches 500 programming languages with 700 programming tasks. And it's really cool, and Perl 6 uses it all the time. Perl 5i, I just found out, uses it. I added a language called TestML to it. Um, but the one problem is, is that getting to code examples is hard, and then you've got to cut and paste them out. So basically, I wrote a Perl script that turned the whole thing into a Git repository. So you can check it out from GitHub. And let's see what's in here. A lot of code. You can look at all the... Uh, the code in 500 languages at 700 programming tests um, ever written, and enjoy yourself. And that's uh, that's about it. So. Um. Oh, and uh, one other thing, one last thing. Hey, hey. Okay, so. Uh, uh, I, I heard some talk of IRC, and it warmed my heart. This is my first Yapsi, um, but. Uh, so how many of you have heard of FNET and, on IRC? And how many of you remember when FNET was fairly young? And do you remember those fin Finnish guys? So uh, hi, my name is Wumpus, and I created FNET because the Finns made me do it. <laughs> Although I did quit IRC Cold Turkey on January 1st, 1992. Uh, you can still talk to me about it. And, and one last thing, my ad. Uh, so I, I'm up against Ricardo tomorrow at uh, 1.30 p.m. He's going to be talking about the state of Perl 5 porters. And I'd actually rather go to his session than mine. But if you want to hear about a Perl startup, uh, come see me at 1.30 tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>Alas, poor CGIPM. I knew him, Horatio. Uh, I'm Perrin Harkins. I work for We Also Walk Dogs, and I'm here to bid a fond farewell to CGIPM. Um, listen, I, I, have, I admit I have bashed CGIPM plenty of times, um, and I wouldn't recommend anybody use it for new code today. Um, and I won't even argue about it being removed from the core. but. Um, many of the people in this room um, are here for, in one way or another because of Lincoln Stein and CGIPM. <clears throat> so um, Lincoln took the Perl 4 CGI lib PL and um, replaced it with a nice Perl 5 module with lots of bells and whistles. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it's hard to appreciate now what a big deal this was for Perl at the time. Um, everybody wanted to put their stuff on the web, and thanks to CGIPM, Perl was the fastest, easiest way to do it. Um, and Perl got a whole new user base out of that and became inextricably linked with web development, for better or worse. Um, and there was a lot of help learning CGI, thanks to the enormous Perl doc. Uh, <coughs> They came with the CGI module. In fact, um, this was so comprehensive that it was published as a book. <laughs> Seriously, this book is like basically the pod. Um, and you know, you can see the title here: "Official Guide to Programming with CGI PM: The Standard for Building Web Scripts." And it's not really an exaggeration. Um, this was probably your best guide to learning CGI in any language at that time. Um, the RFC for CGI was written later. Uh, so, uh, besides the historical significance of this, um, there's also, it's worth noting a couple of cool features that CGI brought, which are, which are now pretty much taken for granted. Um, one thing was CGI CARP. Uh, 
uh, you didn't have to flip over to your terminal anymore and look in the, uh, in the error log. Now you could actually see the messages right in your browser. That was a huge time saver. It was amazing. It also had a command line interface, so you could test your code right for the command line. You could even write programs which would work in a CGI environment and a command line environment, which was also pretty awesome. When Doug McEachern came along with Mod Perl, um, CGI PM was adapted so that you could run the same code under Mod Perl without modification, um, or if you had not used lexical variables with a lot of modification. Um, and then with a few lines of code, you could run it under fast CGI as well. So basically, uh, CGI PM was the, the first sort of abstraction layer for web environments in Perl. There's also, um, I mean, I know the code is ugly. Um, and if I was working on a project where somebody was writing code like this, I would be sad. Uh, but as a Perl newbie, Looking at this stuff, um, I mean, basically, he takes um, a pile of strings, autoload an eval, and generates an entire procedural and object-oriented interface. Um, it's pretty amazing. And uh, it really opened my eyes to what, uh, what you could do with Perl and how flexible it was. So um, it looks like it may be time for CGIPM to leave this Perl core and uh, you know, go join Bilbo and Frodo on the boat, <laughs> head to the Elven lands. Uh, but let's just take a second to thank CGIPM um, for all it's done for us. Rest well, old friend. Wow, there's a lot of people out here. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Grangard. I run your Los Angeles Pearl Mongers. And I say your because you are welcome to come visit. And in fact, when you come visit, you're welcome to talk. Um, so if any of you find yourselves passing through LA for, I don't know, a layover, an hour or two, whatever, uh, call us up. <laughs> we don't use phones. All right, email us up, and uh, we'll move the meeting around, and you can come talk, and your talk can be named uh, like our most recent blah blah blah, you probably won't learn anything from this, and we will still sit in rapt attention. Uh, that may only apply to MJD. All right, uh, again, please come, and uh, if you're looking to work there, Pearl.LA should have some of the companies in the area that uh, might hire you. So go for it. And that brings us to the end of the second day of Lightning Talks. There's still one more. <laughs> still one more round tomorrow. Before everyone leaves, if you're giving a Lightning Talk tomorrow, most of them have been accepted already. The order's not set. But before the session, the closing keynote, please come sit in the front to make, keep things speeded along. We did fairly well today. We started seven minutes late. We finished seven minutes late. I kept my ground. <laughs> so that's it for tonight. Now up the ramp, follow the brown shirts. Time to eat. <laughs>